So here's a table that summarizes SN1 versus SN2 reactions. The first thing you should do is to look at the structure of the alkyl halide. If it's a primary alkyl halide, it's always going to proceed via an SN2 mechanism. SN2 mechanisms require decreased steric hindrance in order for the nucleophile to function properly. So primary alkyl halides have the, have the, have, are the least sterically hindered. A primary alkyl halide would not react via an SN1 mechanism because an SN1 mechanism produces carbocations, and a primary carbocation is not very stable at all. So for all these reasons, primary alkyl halides will be SN2. Secondary alkyl halides are a little bit harder to figure out because it could be either SN2 or SN1. So to break that tie, you have to also look at your nucleophile and your solvent. If you have a strong nucleophile and a polar aprotic solvent, in the last video we saw polar aprotic solvent favor SN2 mechanisms. If you have a relatively weak nucleophile and a polar protic solvent, that's going to favor an SN1 mechanism because the polar protic solvent will stabilize the resulting carbocation. Tertiary alkyl halides are always going to be SN1 because tertiary alkyl halides produce tertiary carbocations, which are very stable. SN2 mechanisms wouldn't really happen uh, uh, for tertiary alkyl halides because there'd be too much steric hindrance, too much stuff in the way. All right, so let's let's do a bunch of examples and see how to use this little chart that we've created here. So I start with I start with this as my alkyl halide, and I'm going to react that alkyl halide with uh, water. I'm going to heat up the reaction like that. So the first thing you do, structure of your alkyl halide, right? This carbon is the one that's bonded to that bromine. It's connected to one other carbon. Therefore, this is a primary alkyl halide. Primary alkyl halides are always SN2, right? So this is going to proceed via an SN2 mechanism, which we know is a concerted mechanism. What is the nucleophile? Well, water is the nucleophile in this reaction. Water is also the solvent, making this a solvolysis reaction. And that might confuse some people because they say, oh, wait, this is a relatively weak nucleophile and it's polar protic. So why is this proceeding via an SN2 mechanism? The structure of your alkyl halide always wins. So so this is a polar protic solvent, which does favor SN1, but since this is a primary alkyl halide, it's only going to react via an SN2 mechanism, although this reaction does occur rather slowly. All right, so we know the first step is our nucleophile is going to attack our partially positive carbon here. At the same time, these electrons kick off onto our leaving group. So what will that give us, right? This is all a concerted SN2 mechanism. So the, the uh, water molecule is going to add at the same time that the bromine leaves. So our water molecule has now added to our, to our original molecule here. And let's see, it's going to have an extra lone pair of electrons, giving it a positive one formal charge like that. So what else is going to happen, right? Well, another water molecule is going to come along. And instead of functioning as a nucleophile, this time it's going to function as a base. It needs to get rid of that plus one formal charge on the oxygen. So this lone pair of electrons is going to take that proton, right? These electrons are going to kick in here on this oxygen. And so we would end up with ethanol as our product, right? Two lone pairs of electrons on that oxygen and a hydrogen here. So uh, we're lucky that we don't have to worry about stereochemistry for this reaction, right? There are no chirality centers created. So ethanol is the only product for this reaction. So, so the approach is first look at your alkyl halide, figure out what type of mechanism you're going to use, and then go through the problem with the mechanism, thinking about possibilities for stereochemistry. And then you'll finally end up with your product. So there's a lot of work involved with these. But if you, if you, go, through, um, if you go through these problems with, with those steps in mind, they, it'll make them much easier. Let's look at another example, right? So if we, have, uh, if we have this as our alkyl halide, so a bromine right here. Notice stereochemistry is involved. And we're going to react that alkyl halide with sodium cyanide, so Na plus Cn minus, and our solvent will be DMF. So we look at the structure of our alkyl halide first, right? So this is the carbon connected to our halogen. That carbon is connected to 
two other carbons, making this a secondary alkyl halide. We know that secondary alkyl halides can proceed via SN1 or SN2 mechanisms. So we need to look at the nucleophile and the solvent. The nucleophile is cyanide anion, which happens to be a relatively strong nucleophile. Our solvent is DMF, and we saw in the last video that's a polar aprotic solvent. So polar aprotic solvent, strong nucleophile, right? Polar aprotic solvent, strong nucleophile is an SN2 mechanism. So this is going to proceed via an SN2 mechanism. So that means as the nucleophile attacks, you know, our halogen is going to leave. So as this negatively charged carbon is going to attack this carbon, right? That happens at the same time the bromine leaves. And the bromine is on, is on one side of the molecule. The cyanide has to attack from the opposite side of the molecule. So the steric hindrance part to an SN2 mechanism. So when you, when you draw your product, right? When you show the cyanide substituting uh, for the halogen there, you're going to show your cyanide going away from you in space. Okay, because it has to attack from the opposite side of where the bromine is leaving. So you get inversion of configuration, right, via your SN2 mechanism. So this will be the only product for this reaction. Let's look at another one. Let's actually start with the, uh, the same alkyl halide. Okay, so here's our same alkyl halide. This time, we're reacting that with uh, acetic acid. So let's go ahead and draw acetic acid in here, like that. All right, so once again, I, I, since it's the same alkyl halide, I know it's, it's secondary, right? So it's a secondary alkyl halide. This time, this time I have a somewhat weak nucleophile, right? My, my nucleophile uh, would be this oxygen here, because it has lone pairs of electrons on it, like that. Uh, but it doesn't really have a negative one formal charge. It's not really that strong of a nucleophile. It's also protic, right? Because this would be the, uh, this would be the protic part of that solvent. So it's going to function as our nucleophile and our solvent. We go back up here, right? We, 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 find, uh, we find polar protic solvent, relatively weak nucleophile. We'll proceed via an SN1 mechanism. So an SN1 mechanism, right? We know the first step in an SN1 mechanism is formation of our carbocation. So these electrons have to kick off onto our bromine, right, to form our carbocation. So this carbon, this carbon right here, ends up with a positive one formal charge. That is a secondary carbocation. So secondary carbocations have the possibility of rearranging, but in this case, there's nothing that could happen to rearrange to make this a more stable tertiary carbocation. So it's going to stay as a secondary carbocation. But always think about rearrangements as being possible via an SN1 mechanism. So we have a secondary carbocation. This is where our nucleophile is going to attack, right? So a lone pair of electrons is going to attack right here. All right, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, just jump to the products here. So we're going to lose a proton after that attacks, and, and we're going to get our products, right? We're going to add on the oxygen. And since this is an SN1 mechanism, right, the oxygen is going to attack from either above or below this planar sp2 hybridized carbocation here, right? So you're going to get a mixture of inversion of configuration and retention of configuration, as we saw in our SN1 video, right? So when this oxygen attacks, it attacks from above or below, right? If it attacks from this side, right, the oxygen is going to add on to here, and then Let's see, the rest of the molecule would look like that, right? So I already took the proton off in the mechanism just to save time. Okay, so that's one possible product. The other possible product, instead of the oxygen add, adding on as a, as a wedge, it could add on as a dash, right? It, it attacks from the opposite side of your planar carbocation. So these are your two possible products, right? So if I, if I look at them, right, this one over here, this is a wedge. This is retention of absolute configuration. And over here, it's a dash. This is inversion of absolute configuration. Remember, inversion is slightly preferred over retention. Now, this, these two happen to be enantiomers of each other, right? The absolute configuration is different at this carbon. So chirality centers are important to think about, right? If you're starting with a chiral reactant and you end up with a chiral product, right, it's very important to think about that. Right up here too, right? For this for this one as well, this is a chirality center, so you have to specify stereochemistry. So stereochemistry, of course, makes these, makes these problems even harder than they already are. So secondary alkyl halides, right, we did one example where it was an SN2 mechanism with inversion of configuration only, and we did one example where it was SN1, in which case we got both inversion and the retention product after our nucleophile attacked.
All right, let's do uh, let's do one more example. All right, so let's look at let's look at this alkyl halide like that. So we'll put an iodine here. All right, and we're going to react this alkyl halide with methanol. So CH3OH, right? Two lone pairs of electrons. So what kind of an alkyl halide is this guy, right? So this carbon is attached to one, two, three other carbons. So it's tertiary, right? So a tertiary alkyl halide. I go back up to my chart and I say tertiary alkyl halides are going to be SN1. So I think to myself, what is the SN1 mechanism? The first thing that happens is formation of your carbocation, right? So these electrons kick off onto here, forming a tertiary carbocation, which we know are very stable, right? So a tertiary carbocation. And the next step is nucleophilic attack, right? So lone pair of electrons on the methanol is going to attack right here. And that, of course, is now we have to show our oxygen is now bonded to that carbon, right? There's a, there's a hydrogen on that oxygen. There's also a methyl group. There's still a lone pair of electrons, and that gives this oxygen a plus one formal charge. So in the last step of this mechanism, right, another methanol molecule comes along, Right, and this time functions as a base. So it's going to take this proton, and these electrons in here are going to kick off onto your oxygen, and finally we are done. So we'll go ahead and draw the product. Right, so oxygen and a methyl group is your product here. So this is an this is an SN1 mechanism, right, with a stable tertiary carbocation, and then there's also an acid-base reaction to finish this one off. I look at my product and I think to myself, do I have any chirality centers? And and I don't for this reaction. So that means I don't have to worry about specifying any kind of stereochemistry. This will be my only product. So this is how to do SN1 versus SN2 reactions. First, look at the structure of your alkyl halide. And then think about, do I need to look at my nucleophile and polar and, and solvent and figure out what type of mechanism you have. And then you run through your whole mechanism and figure out about stereochemistry, and then you finally end up with your product. So there's a lot involved with SN1 versus SN2 reactions. If you follow these steps, I think it should make it a lot easier for you.